Chapter 16 The sun on your hand, warm on your hand, through the glass, drowsing on your flesh. Him there beside you, saying nothing, eyes coming up, eyes going away, swimming around the bed, in the night and the day, through the weeks. Francie, Mom, Dad, Sam, McEdigan, Witty, Sisters, Doctors, Nurses, strangers, compassionate eyes, pitying eyes, sorrowful eyes, eyes I can't see and yet do see. And now the patch of heat on your hand, and him beside you saying nothing. Come on, Johnny, come on, your home son. Costello got out and guided Johnny, holding his arms. Give you a hand, mate. No, it's all right, Costello said. How much? Nix, the pleasure is mine. And Johnny saw the eyes of pity in the voice, and he said quickly, No, pay him, pay him. All right, Johnny, all right, Costello said, catching the taximan's sympathetic wink and passing over the fare. And the taximan said, Good luck, Johnny, and got into his cab. Costello took the boy's arm and picked up his suitcase and piloted him through the rickety gate and down the hall, the dining room door opened, and his mother threw her arms around him and hugged him. It's so lovely to have you home again, darling. And is he glad to be home? Costello cried with a show of exuberance. Four weeks in that morgue of a hospital would have killed me. But Johnny said nothing. Nothing flickered over his poker face. And the heavy, dark glasses... Gave him with the expression, the appearance of a stranger. Miss Costello looked at her husband and her mouth quivered. He looked glumly at her. Then she splashed some brightness into her voice. Would you like something special to eat, dear? You must be terrible sick of that hospital tack. And Costello jumped in. What about a nice T-bone steak, eh? With onion, gravy, and some of them butte waxy spuds we've got. How'd you like that, Johnny? He waited with a smile on his face, but Johnny shook his head and said he wasn't hungry and whatever they had would be all right with him. He said he'd like to lie down for a while, and Costello said, what about a sit in the sun in the backyard? It'll get the smell of that hospital out of your nose. And Johnny said, all right, and Costello bustled with the chair and put it against the back wall and he piloted Johnny out there and sat him down and he said I know son how you'd like it if I read the paper to you no I'd just like to be alone Johnny said all right son Costello agreed easily but his eyes filled with misery and his shoulders slumped as he walked thoughtfully into the house the sight of his wife sobbing harshly unnerved him and he told her her tears wouldn't do any good but they started into his own eyes and the muscles twitched in his jaws and he let his emotion flood in a tirade against the world miss costello stood up to the call of the dinner trumpets no use getting down about it i suppose got to bear up can be thankful it's not worse. Costello turned and glared at her. Worse? How worse could it be? A career ahead of him. A wonderful fighter like him never to have the thing nearest his heart. At his peak and this terrible thing happens and he can never fight again. Oh, who cares if he never fights again? She said sharply. Who cares about that? I was against it. I never wanted it. You encouraged it. Now you whine about him never fighting again. He's blind, but he could be dead. Do you understand that, Dad? She swept out into the kitchen and left him staring. And he sat down heavily on the sofa and thought back over Johnny's life and his life with Johnny. And he always... Came back to the headlines, the newspaper headlines. After the fight, the harping on the tragedy and the warm tributes and the brilliance of the boy ordered to scar your heart because it came after. And Sam Piercy talking 
in a ring of men, and you were one of them listening. And Sambirshi said, the greatest proof of Johnny's ability is that fight, the way he handled a man like Wally McNabb, and made him look like a fifth raider. That's the staggering thing. A bit of a boy, a baby. I know I knew Johnny's gift, but I can tell you he astonished me just the same. A world champion, if ever there was one. And all the men agreed, and they were trainers and fighters and sports writers, old hands who knew the game. That's the terrible thing, and that's the thing he feels more than he feels the blindness. What the blindness has done to him, and that's why he didn't talk at the hospital, lay in that bed and talk to no one, not even his flesh and blood, lay there shocked with grief and horror, a few words maybe, and them not even sensible. And he thought, I'll go down after dinner and have a yarn with Sam Piercy and bring Sam back and have him talk to Johnny. That'll cheer Johnny, and Sam can tell Johnny what a champ he is, was. You retired champion, anyway, Johnny. You went out with ultraweight king of Australia on your shoulders. Johnny will like to talk to Sam. He found Sam in his gym and said what he thought, but Sam shook his head. I don't think I ought to, Peter. Not yet, anyway. I thought it might give him some heart. Depress him all the more, I think, Sam said. He's too bitter about it all. He's in no mood to want to remember himself as a hero. He won't see it that way, the way you think. No, I reckon you're right, Costello said thoughtfully, with a respect for Sam's shrewdness. Suppose I should have thought of that myself. But it's such a cruel bastard of a thing, I don't know what to think. In a way, Peter, I blame you for it. Costello's eyes shot open, and he stood in mystified astonishment. Me, good God, what do you mean? Before Johnny came to me, Sam said, Now just keep quiet. He went, as you know, to a gym run by Joe Chagru. I don't know whether you were ever awake up to Chagru. But you should have been, because there's, that's where Johnny was ruined. That's where the finest champion I ever trained got his death blow. Costello stared at him, and Sam Piercy said kindly, I know, Johnny didn't tell you, I suppose. The hidings he took, like all the kids, they're so eager. They'd get in with Joe Lewis for a brass fighting. Johnny was no different, as I see it. When he come to me, I put him right about a lot of things in this game, and they just opened his eyes, and he's intelligent, that boy. How about the boys? <clears throat> Crazy about fighting, and haven't got enough savvy to come in out of the rain. They're going overboard every day. You never hear about them. But Shagru and the likes of him cried Costello furiously. How do the dirty swipes get away with it? Who's to stop them, Sam said, shrugging his shoulders. You can't get as mad as hell about it, but they've got it sewn up. There's no law to touch them. It makes me so bloody sick, and I mean sick in here, in the guts, when I see and know what goes on, that I often feel like chucking the whole game and getting to hell away from it, and never thinking of it again, but I go on. You look after your fighters, though. Bet your sweet life I do. I'm my own boxing commission, and I stick to the rules. And he, Peter Costello, how he worked this system and his administration, and how he was popular with many for it and unpopular too with others. A boxer's got to be protected from himself, he said. Washed up, they'll go on fighting, suffering injuries, just chopping blocks, Dumb, stupid reflexes, so twisted they can't even shape up. I tell you, these stumble bums that get in the ring over and over again, women, ha women have a better chance. He pointed around his gymnasium. You won't see them in here. Soon as fighters, soon as a fighter's on the skids, out he goes as far as I'm concerned. And I do that for his own good. I drill him to get out and get another job, and I do all I can to help him get one. Some listen, some don't. Promoters, trainers, managers, there's plenty of grouters and bush rangers to do over the has-beens again. That's why 
I say there ought to be a law boycotting fighters like that from killing themselves. Costello went home thinking deeply and with pain of what Sam Piercy had told him. And that evening, after tea, Johnny was lying on his bed when his mother switched on the light and said cheerily, A visitor for you, Johnny. And Francie walked through into the room, and Miss Costello closed the door and left them alone. Francie, sudden tears sparkling in her eyes, couldn't get any words of greeting out. She fell down beside him at the side of the, his bed and clasped his head in her hands and kissed him and rubbed her cheek against his face. The arms that he put around her shoulders were not tightly hooped, but loose and perfunctory, and they fell away and dropped on the bed. And he said with irritation, You're crying. What are you crying for? She was a little surprised at the tone of his voice and brushed her tears quickly as if he could see her and said brightly, There, I'm not crying. And she said joyously, How is my darling boy? But the tears smarted back in her eyes and she bit her lip. She wanted to take his body and hold it close to her and help him do anything for him. She said, how about a smile, honey? You know, I haven't seen that smile for a whole four weeks. I watched for it every time I went to the hospital, but it never came. I'm sorry, Johnny said gravely. He worked his shoulders higher on the pillow, and she took his hand and rubbed it between her own. You mustn't feel too terrible about it, darling. Easy talk. Buck me up. Talk. What does she know? What does anybody know? thing you wanted more than anything in life gone. The search engine ended, the treasure found, and the world ending in the finding of it. Dead and alive to know you were dead. Your world paths leading everywhere, the resting place here, the thought there, but all leading to this, and this the dead stop. How else, else should I feel? He asked irritably. You've got to have faith, Johnny. I have, and you must have, too. We'll find some way. There's no way. I'm finished. But you're not. You're so young yet, and somehow I'm sure there's some doctor can do something. He jerked his head towards her, and she saw the disgust on his face. You're talking about this, he cried, gesturing at his eyes. What's the difference whether I can see or can't see? Give me the sight back. I still can't fight. I can never fight again. Don't you understand that? She was hurt by the tone of his voice and looked in hurt at him. And she <clears throat> understood just how much that life had meant to him when it was the paramount affliction of his tragedy. When his blindness was low in second place, so low that it meant hardly anything to him, dwarfed by the gigantic shadow of the other, Yes, darling, I realize how terribly disappointed it must be, and I can't tell you how much I feel for you about it, but that disappointment will pass in time. And she looked at him, then you'll feel the grief of being blind, but you'll be glad it happened when it did, and that you are not worse injured, injured in your brain and invalid in a mental asylum. But you won't stay blind if I can help it. We can try everything, and we will. It's my fault this happened, he said suddenly. Oh, it's not, darling. I know there was something wrong with my eyes. I had blackouts now and then, but I told myself it was nothing. And not to worry about it, I should have gone to a doctor when I first knew and been treated, and this might never have happened. She gazed at him, not knowing what to say. Then she stumbled out, but wouldn't the stadium doctor have seen it or noticed anything? He shot back. Did the stadium doctor know anything was wrong with Al Benjamin? Did he see the clot of blood in his brain? One punch fixed Al, and he died in the ring. Ah, uh, it's my fault. I knew better. Francie's heart melted completely at the bitterness in his voice. She stroked his brow and hair, and she said, Please don't think about it, Johnny. Oh, Johnny, I love you so much. I want you, I want to look after you and have you 
near me all the time. She kissed him passionately on the mouth but felt no response in him and fell back and stared at him, puzzled and dismayed, and he said, Francie, you're a wonderful girl, and it's been great fun knowing you, but I don't want you to come here again. But Johnny, she was shocked. I want you to go away and forget me. Oh, Johnny, darling, what are you saying? Wild tears sprang into her eyes, and her face crumpled. I don't understand. I'm trying to tell you we can't be married. She stared at him. You don't mean that, Johnny, but why, why? He became a little angry. Can't you see why you wouldn't want to marry me? But Johnny, that's silly. I do, I do. Half a man, he sneered at her. More than ever, I want to marry you. Please don't say things like that. Why, more than ever, he asked quickly. Because I'm poor, Johnny, because you pity me. Well, I don't want pity. You hear, I don't want it. But, darling, I love you. This doesn't make any difference to me. She felt him getting away from her, his bitter spirit taking him away from her. She threw her arms against his shoulders and lay her head on his breast, crying, I won't give you up, I won't, I won't, and I won't let you say those things. You can't marry me, Francie, I won't let you, don't you see? You belong to the light, to everything on the other side of this darkness, where I used to be. That's where you belong, and you are going to stay there. You're not going to be any crutch for me, any seeing dog. I just want to be your wife, Francie said helplessly. He put his hands against her shoulders and eased her up gently, but she wouldn't let him go. And he came up from the pillow, and she clutched him to her and wept quietly, bitterly, and said, Johnny, don't you realize I want you, and only you, and life might as well end for me here and now in this room if I can't have you. You're my life, and I don't want to go on living without you. I couldn't. Ah, Francie, sweetheart, Johnny said, tenderness trembling in his voice you're everything to me too and that's why i want you to go away and forget me i don't want you tied for life to a blind man you're too good for that francie leaned back and flared if you say that again i'll choke you i don't think you ever did love me but francie that's not true i did and do francie stood up and looked down at him i thought you had spirit johnny costello she snorted I never thought you'd give in to defeat as easily as this, what you call defeat. She gazed at his face, trying to read the expression there. The response to her attitude, uneasily wondering whether it was the right line she was taking. And I'm not everything to you. Your defeat is more to you. Your dead glory is more to you. Well, that's not the way I love you. Nothing takes first place over that. And I resent your lumping me in with those selfish and hateful women who drop the men they love when the men they love look like being a burden to them. Francie, if you can't see now that I'm the girl you ought to marry, I'll stick like glue till I make you see it. I don't give it in easily, Johnny, she said. And that was the sitting in the sting in the tail and she was half sorry, and then trepidation when it came out, and she hated herself for it, seeing the dark flush come on his face, and she wanted to hold him and pour out her contrition. But she controlled the impulse, and bent and kissed him, and said, Good night, sweetheart, I'll be thinking of you, and he heard her steps on the floor, and the door open and shut, and he lay back and swallowed, and tears sneaked slowly out of his eyes, and the mucus ran back in his throat. In the dining room, Francie saw Father Duffy, and they greeted each other. Miss Costello was clinking cups in the kitchen, and she came through with a tray. You might as well have a cup of with us, dear. Francie, hopping her eyes, hoping her eyes didn't look too red and swollen, smiled shyly and sat down, and Peter Costello turned a heavy face to her and smiled. Did you spark him up? I think I did, Francie nodded, trying to be bright. That's the girl. He turned suddenly to the priest. Oh, I beg your pardon, Father, I forgot. He stood up. Come in and see Johnny now. No, just a moment, Peter. Father Duffy raised a podgy finger. I think perhaps he may have had enough tonight. 
he probably wouldn't care to see me. Ah, uh, nonsense, gestured Costello. He'll be... No, no, Peter, insisted Father Duffy gently. If you don't mind, I'll come around again in the morning. He smiled at the puzzled Costello and at Francie's stare, and she instantly dropped her eyes peevishly, realizing the moment she did so that she had confirmed his understanding. And Miss Costello looked at him and was grateful with her eyes for his perception. Costello flopped down and sighed heavily. I don't know, I don't know where all this trouble comes from. Anyone would think a man clobbered a chow or something. Peter gasped Miss Costello. Mind your words, the priest here and everything. Costello pulled nervously at his chin, but Father Duffy only smiled. Francie spoke up quickly. He's with us, and that's what matters. We've got to stick by him and push him from us, and not push him from us. He needs us more than ever now, but you mustn't mollycoddle him, said Father Duffy. Not a boy like Johnny. That's right, not at Miss Costello. I found that out today. I've realized it too, Francie said. And Father Duffy looked at her. The girl, This girl has faith and love in quantity and quality, and faith and love can be an imperishable weapon and an invincible defense. This girl has it as the martyrs had it, and no man, nothing on earth, could destroy that in them, only destroy the clay that housed and breathed it. Am I to tell what I know, that Johnny Costello will never come completely out of that total darkness because his optic nerve is permanently injured, but there is a chance that he will partly see that he will have half darkness, which is at least half light the twilight of the pure blind doctors can take him that far how am i to know that faith and love can't take him further costello shrugged his shoulders and shook his head god i don't know sometimes i wonder if a man wouldn't be better off just drifting with the tide where's all the trying get you swamps you and you don't give a fig whether you live or die. Miss Costello looked at her husband in disgust, but Father Duffy was unruffled. Listen to me, Peter. Life hasn't come to an end because you can't see further than the nose of your face. Say you're out in the streets and you're watching me, and I'm walking alone, and I pat a dog and nod to a man and slip on a banana skin, and I come to my gate, and you're watching me all this time, and you see me go into me house, and the door shut. I've gone beyond your eyesight and beyond your mind, haven't I? But I'm still as large as life on the other side of that door. And if you watch long enough, you'll see me come out again in the same way, though everything at times might look dark and at an end if you hang on. Life will bring something forward. But what's got me beat, and why the evil, the tragedy, in the world? If I knew that, in its essence, retorted Father Duffy, I'd be sitting on the right-hand side of God the Father, not on this chair in your dining room. Francie said she'd better be running along if they'd excuse her, and could she please come again tomorrow night? Miss Costello said they wanted her to. The girl made her light-hearted but respectful farewells and went. And in the room... They talked, and the priest asked about Dano. Had they heard from him, Costello was better, broken his mother's heart. That feller Johnny saw him twice, tried to get him to come home, but he wouldn't. He's a no good, and we're better off without him here. But the ring of sincerity in his voice didn't fool the priest. Behind all that hostility, you've got a heart for him, Costello and your heart is anxious, and you've got conscience about him, and your conscience is reproachful, and that's what you fight, and he said strangely, I would not be surprised in the least if that boy in the end turned out to be a better man than all of us.